so glad that you could join us for our Easter morning service. God's love for us is so great that he sent his son to die, to suffer and die on the cross for our sins. Today we celebrate his resurrection. Let's come praise and glorify our God together. Rejoice in that truth together on this Easter Sunday morning. For the praise of his glory, he's the God who saves. And that's why we can gather and worship him and celebrate the salvation he provided in his son, Jesus Christ. We count it a privilege to gather together as a family of believers, even though we can't be physically together. We are together in spirit and heart and mind and the spirit of God joins us together as we rejoice. Jesus Christ is alive. He represents us in the presence of the Father, even as we gather here on earth, and then we come to worship him this morning. It's good to have you join with us. few things to bring to your attention as announcements. This is Easter Sunday. Normally, we have a Good Friday service, which we did not have this year. And we do not have a Sunday night service, but this Easter, we did not have the Friday night, but we will be having Sunday night. So I want to encourage you, uh, maybe together with family or doing special things this afternoon, but we'd like to have you come back at 6 o'clock and join us for a time of fellowship around the Word. 
And I'm going to spend a fair amount of the evening on questions and answers. Questions that you've submitted and things were pertaining particularly to the second coming of Jesus Christ. A couple questions related to the death of Christ and then the uh, coming rapture of the church. So I'll talk about that tonight, our regular studies in Romans 8. may be referring to that, but then we'll spend uh, quite a bit of time dealing with the questions. A few other things, as is the pattern for the country, uh, we'll not be having our regular meetings, but we have to bring people together through the week, so they're all canceled. As you're aware, a number of these are going on, and you can access them with your computers. We have Sunday school classes being taught in the morning. Uh, we have the Tuesday morning ladies' study you can access as well. And then Wednesday night for Awana and Girls of Grace, uh, those kind of uh, activities, check the internet. If you get on and check uh, the website, they'll update you on what is going on and so on. This Wednesday night, the Board of Elders will meet, and there are less than 10 of us. We will be meeting. You can pray for the elders as they meet. One of the things we'll be doing is considering the candidacy of Ben Powell as uh, a deacon over at Nursery and We Care. Remind you of your giving. This is about the time in the service normally when we would be taking an offering, and we're not. But I encourage you to uh, remember that. The activities and ministries go on. So you can drop your offerings off at Sound Words through the week. You can give online, or you can store them up. If you have a safe at home, put all those gifts in there, and you can bring them when we get back together again. I think that's all the announcements will do. Let me read you from the end of the book of Luke. What Jesus said to his disciples after his resurrection, as he unfolded to them that his death and resurrection was prophesied in Scripture. We read at the end of the Gospel of Luke 24, chapter 24, beginning with verse 45. Then he opened their minds to understand the Scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written, that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead the third day, and that repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations, beginning from Jerusalem. Let's have a word of prayer together. Thank you, Lord, for what we are celebrating in a special way today, that your Son, our Savior, the one who loved us and died for us, is alive. He is seated at your right hand in glory. He is there to represent and intercede on our behalf. And we come to worship you today on the basis of what he has done for us. We come because he provided salvation that cleanses and forgives sin that is provided for you declaring us mm -hmm. to be forgiven, righteous and acceptable in your presence. So we come to worship you today because of what Christ has accomplished for us. We thank you that a salvation that has been provided by his death, sealed with his resurrection, is moving toward its final completion and realization of is coming again to this earth to rule and reign over all creation. We come to give you praise, to honor you. We come on the basis of the one who bore our sin, was a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, and yet because of his bearing our penalty, we have life through faith in him. We come in his name. Amen.
states God's love for us extremely well is one that we all know in John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish and eternal life.
privilege it is to gather in the name of Jesus Christ and worship him. And as the song said, we proclaim him in song and in word. As I read to you from Luke 24, that repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations. Little did those, that handful of disciples know as they gathered with Christ resurrected Christ that over 2,000 years the name of Christ would be proclaimed that there is salvation there is forgiveness of sins 
found in his name, who he is, and what he has done. And that's what we're going to look at together today. We're in the book of Titus in our regular studies on Sunday morning, and that's where we're going to be today, Titus chapter 2. We come in the study of Titus, one of those sections in the Word of God that stands out for its conciseness and clarity in presenting what Christ has accomplished by his death and resurrection. In fact, this is a passage that we've looked on on other occasions on Easter Sunday morning because it presents so clearly the work that Christ has accomplished. In fact, in verses 11 to 15, where we're going to be in our study, he talks about what Christ did in the past, what he is doing in the future, and what he is doing in the present. So, his first coming, his second coming, and what is going on in between. What his salvation has done for us, and his impact in our ongoing daily lives. Look at Titus is primarily about our conduct, our behavior as believers. We are to live godly lives because we are God's children. And in chapter 2 particularly, we have looked at this, the first 10 verses talked about conduct for people, various ages, various uh, positions in life. Older men, older women. Younger men, younger women. Slaves. Then we come down to verse 11. And you'll note verse 11 begins with a little preposition for. And normally we think of Paul's letters beginning with Paul laying the doctrinal foundation, establishing the biblical truth that will result in conduct. We think of like a book like Ephesians. The first three chapters talk about uh, the theological foundation of the salvation God provided in Christ so we could live godly lives. Then he picks up to chapter 4 and talks about our walk as God's people. But in the book of Titus, he started out talking about conduct, and now he's going to talk about the doctrine that enables and requires godly living. And then he'll go back to conduct, as we will come into chapter 3 in future studies. And then he'll come back to the foundation of that conduct, the work of Christ. So crucial, we keep these things in proper perspective. Works are an essential part of our salvation. Now, if I just said that, it leaves you with confusion. Because you think, well, then, we're supposed to work... And if we do good works, God will save us. No. Works are an essential part of our salvation because they are the essential result of our salvation. They do not bring about our salvation. If you try to mix being saved, how can I become acceptable to God? Well, I'll do my good works and trust in Him. No. Because if you bring your good works in, it's no longer by God's grace. And that's where we pick up in verse 11. Of Titus chapter 2. He says, For the grace of God has appeared. And we have one long sentence from verse 11 down through verse 14. Elaborating on this grace that has appeared and what it accomplished and what it is to do to us to have believed in Christ today and what it will do for us in the future. So, for the grace of God has appeared. That's why we must live godly lives. That's why older men who have believed in Christ must live as Paul's instructed them, the older women, the younger women, the younger men, the slaves. All areas of our lives and conduct are molded and shaped because the grace of God has appeared. And note, it's God's grace. Now, 
grace by definition is unmerited and undeserved. We sometimes simply describe it as unmerited or undeserved favor. You cannot earn grace. You cannot work to acquire grace. If you would include works, then grace wouldn't be grace. So we have to understand what grace is. It's not something you earn or deserve. It, by definition, is something God is going to do for us. He has done for us. He provided Jesus Christ. So the grace of God, what God has done, intervening on behalf of sinful people to do for them what they could not do for themselves, our hopeless, lost condition. It has appeared in verse 11, and that refers to the coming of Christ. Christ coming to earth manifesting and revealing the plan and work of God to provide salvation for lost sinful people. And it will be a matter of God's grace intervening to do what only He could accomplish for us. It has appeared. Um, we'll talk about this when we get down into chapter 3, verse 4. But when the kindness of God our Savior and His love for mankind appeared, God's kindness, you will talk about His mercy, His love, His grace, when we get into chapter 3, all these words piling up what God has done. It was grace, mercy, kindness, love. It appeared. How did it appear? When Christ Jesus came to this earth, was born into the human race, as the God-man, he suffered and died on the cross to pay the penalty for our sin, which is death. He was raised from the dead as testimony of the fact that all that was necessary for salvation for sinners had been done. So the grace of God has appeared what does that grace do? Verse 11. It is the, what brings salvation to or for all men. That's the wonder of the death of Christ. It is a message of hope and life for everyone. But not everyone who's talking about Christ and talking about hope understands. God has done for us what we could not do for ourselves. He's brought salvation to all men, for all men. It doesn't matter who you are, where you are, male, female, slave, master, rich, poor, whatever nationality or race, there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. We'll look at that passage out of uh, Timothy uh, a little bit later. Uh, that's what God has done to provide salvation. Uh, it brings salvation to all men. That's why we read in Luke chapter 24 that salvation, repentance for sins, in His name, would be proclaimed to all the nations because he is the only savior that's why we carry this message aren't we glad living in the United States of America the gospel has come to us uh, that salvation that Christ provided by his death 2,000 years ago on the cross sealed with his resurrection down through the millenniums the two millenniums that have passed since that event. And we have come to hear it and believe it. It's a salvation for us. The same as people in other countries, other nations. It's one salvation provided for all men. Thy grace brings salvation to all men. 
and it provides salvation by grace. We'll back up to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2 in your Bibles, verses that uh, many of you have memorized. In Ephesians chapter 2, Paul is unfolding the truth that we're talking about. But chapter 2 opens up, verse 1, You were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked. You know the connection here between our dead spiritual condition and the life we lived in that condition. Uh, death in Scripture is not non-existence. Death in Scripture is separation. Physical death is when the body is separated from the spirit. The immaterial part, the body without the spirit, is dead, the Bible says. It's a separation. The person has left their physical body. Physical death occurs. Spiritual death is when a person is separated from God. He's spiritually dead. Uh, there's no relationship between him and God that is favorable or good. Eternal death is being sentenced to hell separated from God for eternity. So when he talks in verse 1, you were... So when he talks in verse 1, you were did not walk, you live. We had no spiritual relationship with God. We were the enemies of God. We were in rebellion against God. We were serving the devil. That's what he says. We walked according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Anyone who has not placed their faith in Christ and Him alone is walking in disobedience against God, rejecting the salvation He has. We all lived there. That was the state. That is the state of everyone. Until they come to understand and believe the salvation God's provided in Christ. Uh, but God... But God, verse 4, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead, made us alive together with Christ. How? By grace you have been saved. And then he brought that, verse 7, in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace. The grace of God's appeared, providing a Savior. So that the only thing we can do, the Bible calls it a gift. The wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ. So when you hear the message of the death and resurrection of Christ, the penalty for your sin, and you believe in Him, I'm going to quit trusting my good works, my church, my baptism, sacraments, whatever, and I'm going to trust him and him alone. And what God promised to do in and through him, then I'm saved. So it's by grace. Verse 8, for by grace you have been saved through faith. That's all there is. There's no, nothing between God and you but your sin. And when that sin is dealt with and you are cleansed, now you are brought into direct relationship with God. I am not a priest to stand between you and God. You are a priest who goes directly to God. That's the point. We have been saved through faith, by grace. It's not our work. It's a gift of God. Could God be any clearer um, that no one would boast? We have nothing to boast about. I'm saved. How did you get saved? God said, here's a gift. And I received it by believing what he was giving me was true. And that brought my salvation. We'll come back to Ephesians 2 in a moment, but come back to Titus 2. The grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to or for all men. Again, that's what Jesus said. Repentance for forgiveness of sins would be preached in his name to all the nations. It's the same for any nation. Um, doesn't matter whether you're in China or in Russia or in the United States or in 
Latin America, it doesn't matter. The beauty of it is that one salvation provided by that one God-man dying on the cross is sufficient for all who believe in him. So it's appeared for all men. Note verse 12. It is instructing us. So remember Titus, Paul had been writing to Titus about conduct. <coughs> and he's instructed about conduct. We just gave an example in the first ten verses. How older men were to conduct themselves. Older women, younger men, younger women, slaves. Um, what's proper conduct? Well, he told us. Well, what's the basis of that? That's what we have here, verse 12. This grace that has appeared and brought salvation is now instructing us. We get the uh, English word pedagogy from that word translated instructing here. Um, it has the word for a child uh, in it, and so it's often used of instructing children. Uh, but it carries that idea of instructing and all that's involved there. Instructing us. We learn from it. You know, uh, the grace of God has appeared. That happened in the past. Jesus is an heiress tense here. Now it is presently continuing to instruct us about life and how to live. You cannot separate. You see, the order is important. The salvation that we have in Christ changes us within makes us new within. The old are corrupted by sin, enslaving us to sin. That's been dealt with. Now he's made us new. Now we have to learn what has God's grace in salvation done that we now learn from. It is instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts. Ungodliness is everything contrary to the character of God. Everything would be that would be consistent for someone who belongs to Him. Uh, godliness, a life conforming to the character of God, because now we are the children of God through faith in Christ, the salvation, so that we were born again, born from above, the new birth. You have that through faith in Christ. So now we are being instructed and learning. We've been taught to deny ungodliness and worldly desires. The things that are characteristic of this world. That doesn't mean we withdraw from life. But the things that the world would hold out as important and necessary. Come over just to one passage. 1 John chapter 2 all the way back almost to the book of Revelation not the gospel of John but first epistle of John all the way uh, if you get to the book of Revelation at the end you come forward through a few small books and you'll be in first John chapter 2 and John who also wrote the gospel of John but this is his epistle says in verse 15 of first John 2 and he's writing verse 1 of chapter 2 to little children <coughs> So you see, it's children, the children of God. And the writing goes to you to instruct you so that you don't sin. Uh, we're to live lives pleasing to God. Verse 15 then, do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If any man loves the world, the love of the... Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the boastful pride. Of life is not from the Father, but from the world. And that's all temporal, temporary. The world is passing away with its lust. 
Those who do, do the will of that, the one who does the will of God lives forever. Children, it's the last hour. We're moving toward where Paul will go in second uh, in Titus chapter two uh, shortly. The hope we have. So that's what he's talking about in the world. You know, we live in this world. We have things that are needed, food, clothing, uh, shelter, and uh, we enjoy those things, but they cannot get the love of our heart. There are things that we have, that we use, but they don't control us. We're living in a time of pressure, not only in our country, but the world. And with the uh, virus going on, People concerned, but I realize these are things that are temporal. Doesn't mean we don't take it seriously. Doesn't mean we don't want to follow the rules as we are. But really, you know, if I lose everything here, I have not lost anything of true eternal anything of true eternal value because it's all passing away. So we hold those things lightly even as we enjoy them and what God has provided. But they're not the love of our heart. We always want to keep that intact, the things of this world. They don't impact us in the same way they do the world. Because what we have of value is stored away in heaven as a treasure and inheritance God is reserving for us. Come back to Titus. That's what he's talking about when he says we deny ungodliness and worldly desires. The things that drew me before do not any longer. And he goes on with a list here. Sensibly, this has been one of the favorite words of Paul as we looked at. That word sensible, he's uh, four times already. Uh, it means with sound mind, clear thinking. I am now thinking as God would have me think. We uh, sometimes express it with eternity's values in view. Uh, we set our mind not on the things of the world. I'm starting to think sensibly. Before I was thinking irrationally in light of eternity. All caught up in this. I'm amazed. See men with vast wealth nearing the end of their physical life and it seems they have no care about eternity. It makes no sense uh, to be caught up with the things of this life. We're constantly reminded of this in scripture. Peter put it, all these things are going to be burned up. When God makes all things new with a new heaven and new earth at the end of Revelation, I don't want my whole life to be invested here. But I want to live here in a way that's pleasing to God. Live sensibly. And then think biblically. Sound mind. Balance. So what comes along with the world? Now things have changed so dratic, drastically. It's, I've never seen it like this before. Never happened in my lifetime. First time in the history of our country this has been declared. And yeah, but I'm still balanced. Um, doesn't mean if I've lost my job, I don't have concerns, but I take it to the Lord in prayer. He's taking care of me today. I have a balance, a sensibleness. You live righteously. Um, that's the, the other side, uh, righteously and godly. I mean, live according to what is right, what is just, uh, what is according to the character of God. That's the next word, godly. The contrast to ungodly. I, the character of God. Uh, I want to be a righteous person, a godly person. And I love the way it's put. In the present age, and uh, it literally says, in the now age. And I like that because it reminds you the present age, 
Because there's something about that word now. We say we're going to do it now. It brings to your attention uh, a brevity. This is the now age. This period of time in which we're living. Uh, it's the now age. It will pass. It will soon be gone. When we read in 1 John 2, two minutes life are passing. Our lives are passing. Most of my life is behind me. And we look and see. People have lost much of what they counted dear in a relatively short period of time. Just a reminder. Uh, this is the now age. This is the period of time where God is instructing us how we live. This is an opportunity and a privilege that is unique. That we who have been saved by God's grace are now to live for Him in this now age. A unique period of time where we are privileged to represent Him, manifest His character in a world of darkness. We don't want to be swept along with the world. We don't want to live like the world. This is the day of opportunity. So live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the now age. So you see, he took us from what Christ did for us in his death and resurrection. That's the foundation. When we've believed in him and experienced that salvation, now we're learning that grace, and that's a, what we call the maturing. That's what we're studying in Romans 6, 7, and 8. Sanctification, living godly, holy lives. Um, here's how we are to live. And we live with a future view. So you see, he's talked about the past, he's talked about the present. Now looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. Uh, what a uh, tremendous statement. Uh, we are living in the now age, but we're looking for the age to come. We're looking for the future. We're looking for, and that word carries the idea of that eager expectancy. You know, like you're straining to look. Uh, I just uh, there's expectancy. This ties to what we call the imminency of the Lord's return. We are expecting Him, and we'll talk some about that in our study uh, this evening. To answer some questions that have come in, the imminency of the Lord's return. It gives an expectancy. I'm looking for it. That's what He's saying. Looking for the blessed hope. What's been promised in the coming of Christ? particularly for us as the church, the first phase of what we call the second coming, with the rapture of the church, looking with eagerness, anticipation, expectancy for the blessed hope, the hope of the believer. We don't have time to go through all the passages on the hope of the believer. You see them um, throughout Paul's letters. Not just his letters, but uh, particularly that hope it is not something that may come or may not come. It's something that is assured, and we just can't wait for it to get here. Is the idea. Uh, God cannot lie. He's promised that Christ is coming. Jesus promised before he left. He said in John 14, I'm going to leave, but if I leave, I'll come again and gather you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. Well, what, what's that involved? Well, in my Father's house, there are many dwelling places. I'm going to prepare a place for you. You know what I'm doing while I'm gone. And then I'll come and get you and take you to what I've prepared. Well, boy, we ought to be living on the edge of expectancy. Uh, that's what uh, this word looking for um, that eager anticipation, the blessed hope, uh, the hope that will bring all God's blessings that have pro been promised to us. Um, we saw this in our study in Romans chapter 8. 
the whole creation is groaning, anticipating the time when the sons of God will be revealed. Uh, all that's involved in the second coming of Christ, whether we talk about the first phase of the second coming, when we enter into our inheritance, where Jesus, remember Jesus said, don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth, which can be corrupted and destroyed by all kinds of things. Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. And Peter wrote about the inheritance we have. That's the blessings associated with our hope. So it is the blessed hope. Um, the appearing of the glory. So you note in verse 11, the grace of God has appeared. Now we'll have down in verse 13, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing. Christ is coming again. He appeared in the past. He's going to be appearing again in the future. Um, and someday he'll come and he'll descend from heaven in the clouds and all will see him as he comes to establish his kingdom. Uh, it's the appearing of the, of the glory. Uh, you know, when Christ walked the earth 2,000 years ago, you know, there wasn't the display of the glory that is here, is his. But when he comes to earth again, there will be the full display of his glory. Uh, manifest for all to see. Um, that's why he said, if they tell you Christ has come and he's here, or Christ has come and he's there, don't believe him. Because when I come back to this earth the next time, I will come with a display of the glory that everyone will see. And that's talked about in Matthew 24 and 25. Peter talks about it in his epistles. So we're looking for the appearing of the glory. We based our salvation on what he did for us when he appeared on the earth to suffer and die for our sins. And we are looking with anticipation to all that's involved in his second coming and the appearing of his glory. The one who is our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. And that involves, we'll talk about it tonight, but the first phase of that second coming when we are gathered and transformed into conformity, which what John was talking about, what Jesus was talking about in John 14, I'll take you to my father's house. Then he'll, when he's ready to return to earth in Revelation 19, we will be ready to be revealed as the bride of Christ, the church, and all his glory for all creation. And it's the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. And this is one of those passages that clearly uh, displays the deity of Jesus Christ. When he walked the earth 2,000 years ago, it was veiled in human flesh. All the fullness of deity dwelt in him in bodily form. But it was not displayed for the fullness of his glory. When he comes to earth again, his glory will be fully displayed. He is man, but he is more than man. He is the God-man. Now, fully God, fully man. That deity was veiled. But... When he appears again, it will not be veiled. Uh, he's called our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. And uh, that is a testimony of his deity. Um, one of many passages, like John 1, and the opening verses of the Gospel of John, when the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. This is one of those passages. Um, we're not going to go into the details grammatically, 
Uh, if you read the better commentaries, they'll go into it. It's a rule of Greek grammar called Gramble Sharp's rule. And when you have this kind of construction, uh, the great God and Savior, Christ Jesus, um, you're referring to the same person. Um, so it's uh, our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. He is the great God and Savior. And we could take time, but we won't. Uh, but there are numerous passages and numerous other evidences of Christ's deity in the scripture. And this is just one of them. Uh, but there are a variety of places where he is directly called God and then where he has the uh, characteristics, the attributes of God. He's the one who will judge all men in John 5. Uh, the Father will not judge any. He's committed all judgment to the Son. They are both God, not different gods, but Father, Son, and Holy Spirit comprising one God, three different persons. He accepts worship, um, prayer, and these things. So here we're looking for a full unveiling. Remember, John walked and served with him as a faithful disciple, the Apostle John, during Christ's earthly ministry. And then when John saw something of the glory that was revealed to him of the resurrected Christ, he fell at his feet as a dead man. In the opening chapters of the book of Revelation, um, particularly chapter 1, so uh, someday that glory will be revealed to all. And then we'll cower in fear if they have not believed in him. And judgment will be established. So that's what we're looking for. When he comes to fulfill all. And he's just talking about the general coming. Just like the Old Testament talked about the coming of Christ. It didn't uh, distinguish and clarify that there would be two comings to earth. It just talked about when the Messiah would come. Later revelation in the New Testament revealed what would happen, what, what was prophesied would happen at the first coming, and then 2,000 years, whatever later, uh, certain things would happen at the second coming. So those things were not revealed. Everything that was talked about about his coming will be fulfilled exactly what it is said. The later revelation, he's coming twice. The first coming, to suffer and die, the second coming to rule and reign. So we're looking for that hope. Now what does that do for us? Again, on the past, what he's done for us in the past, the great salvation, and we're learning from that how to live sensibly, godly, uh, righteously and godly. Now we're looking for the blessed hope because of the salvation that we have based upon his first coming. He's the one, verse 14, who gave himself for us. He takes us back to the first coming. To redeem us. So you see how he ties this all together in this one long sentence. The grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. And it's teaching us how to live. And how to have our focus on the second coming. Because he's the one who gave himself for us, taking us back to verse 11. So both our present life and our future hope are tied to what he did for us in providing redemption. He gave himself for us. The sacrificial death. He gave himself to redeem us. It was for us. To redeem us means to set someone free, Lutrao. Set someone free by paying the necessary price. You could purchase a slave out of the slave market and uh, set him free. You paid the price. We were enslaved to the devil, to sin, to the consequences of our sin, to the penalty for of our sin, to the requirements of God's justice. God uh, sent Christ who came 
to give himself, to take our place. Peter puts it in his epistle. He himself bore our sins in his own body on the cross so he might die to sin and live to righteousness. You cannot uh, break apart justification and sanctification. You must understand the distinction between the two, but they are never to be separated. A number of years ago, we had great controversy in the evangelical realm over what's called the lordship of Christ and lordship salvation. And there was confusion generated all around. But the fact of the matter is, he is the Lord Jesus Christ. And when he brings salvation to a life, it's a transformed life. So verse 14, he gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed. Not to leave us as we were. He purchased us from the slave market of sin, if you will, by paying our price. To rescue us from our wretched condition and hopeless destiny. Redeem us from every lawless deed. You see what that means? We no longer live like we lived. We're no longer the same person. That's the only rescue. That's why we don't get involved in any serious way. I mean, we won't help people in need, but basically that's not what the church is about. We're on a rescue mission. Remember what Jesus said his followers were to do as a result of his death and resurrection, what we read at the end of Luke. That salvation can be proclaimed through repentance in his name to all the nations. Try to clean up people's wives. Only God can do that. Uh, to teach anything else is a lie. He gave himself to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify himself. Not enough. Say, well, this is what I don't do. I don't do those things anymore. Well, what do you do? I don't know. I've become a cabbage. I'm just here. No. You live sensibly righteous and godly. Verse 12. You've been purified. Now note this. To purify for himself. A people for his own possession. What a privilege. How all, uh, honored and exalted have we been. I belong. Uh, Jesus uh, is my Savior. I belong to him. He belongs to me. Not for the years of time alone, but for all eternity. Um, that truth that sung. Uh, he redeemed us to purify for himself so we could belong to him. We could be his, his own possession. Is there any higher honor than to say you belong to the living God? Um, you're his. He purchased you. That means all of you. Talk crazy a little bit tonight as well. Uh, the immaterial part of a person. That includes us, all of us, our bodies, our souls, our spirit. Um, we are purified within, without. And to separate that, you, know, you create a dichotomy, then you think, well, he's cleansed me within. You know, I do things with my body that I shouldn't, but at least I'm being cleansed within. The Bible doesn't know that kind of cleansing. He purified for himself a people for his own possession. Note this. Zealous. They have a zeal for good deeds, good works. You see where good works are to come from. A transformed heart. And not just I do them. There's a passion for it. A zeal for it. We are zealots. You know, I don't take it uh, in a shameful way when people say there are people who are fanatics. We are. Christ called us to be fanatics, to let go of everything, all our possessions, even our family, grab onto him. 
follow him. I mean, be zealous for good deeds. The deeds that are consistent with righteousness, godliness, the character of God. Zealous to represent him. To proclaim him. To tell people about him. To tell them about the person who can change their lives. There's a lot comes Easter and I uh, hear people say, oh, uh, this religious leader gave a message of hope. It was so good. The Pope gave a message of hope. It was so good. This pastor gave a hope. Oh, it was so encouraging. Did they tell you how you can have hope? Well, the coming of Christ, the resurrection means we have hope. Well, there's an element of truth in that. Do you understand what the element of truth is? Christ Jesus has come to provide salvation. And when you trust in Him, you enter into the provision of that salvation. You are cleansed. You are forgiven. You are made new. You have hope. Without that, you're just talking Alice in Wonderland. Oh, these are days to have hope. We are people of faith. We have hope. There's hope. We'll get through this. What's that have to do with what the Bible's talking about with hope? You can be a fool and fool yourself with false hope, with transitory hope. Whether we'll get through the virus and the consequences, I don't know. God knows. I assume we will. Unless we're entering to uh, the age of those last days, and even then, they'll probably... The United States could get wiped out, would change biblical prophecy. I don't know. I want to tell people about real hope. They want to tell me, oh yeah, our pastor talked about hope, our priest talked about hope, we really like her. People don't want to hear the negative. We did a funeral sermon here a number of years ago. And I talked about all that God had prepared for those who love him. The glories of what he has said about the new Jerusalem, the inheritance, Everybody sitting out there smiles. And I said, now I have to tell you the bad news. Not everyone's going there. There's not only an eternal heaven, there's an eternal hell. And I was afterwards told some people went out of there livid. I had one man that I had shared the gospel with, and he was livid. That you would talk about that at a time like this. It's a time to talk about positive things. Things of hope. When do you talk about? You may not have hope. This person did. But that doesn't mean you do. If I lure you into thinking, if I'm a medical doctor and tell you, oh, this, this virus won't affect you, and I know your lungs are collapsing, I know you're not able to function on your own for, you know, maybe an hour, I don't know, it's, you're near the edge, and I just say, it's going to be all right. Don't worry about it. Have hope. Have hope. I'm going to see the next patient where there may be hope. Oh, wait a minute. That's not a real doctor. Maybe he could have done something. Yeah, but they wouldn't want to hear bad news. They wouldn't want me to tell them, look, we're going to do this because it could rescue you. In fact, it has rescued people, but I know you don't want to hear that. That's, no, there is real hope. And if we have doubt, look how he wraps this up and leads into the next chapter where we will be as we pick up in our study next time. These things speak and exhort and reprove with all authority. Command. These are not recommendations. These are things that must be done. These are things for God's people. Let no one disregard you. Titus, as Timothy, evidently a younger man. We've talked about that. Doesn't have anything to do with your age. I'm telling you what the Word of God says. That's what matters. Now, we as believers better take it to heart. He's telling believers why they ought to be living godly lives. Why does the church get in such a mess? Well, one reason is not everyone attends a service in a building is truly a believer. 
and unbelievers get mixed in with believers, and sooner or later the word antagonizes them to the point they cause trouble. And then there are believers who are somewhat comfortable in their ungodly life and don't want to be told that they can't live like that and be considered a believer. And they get unsettled. But that doesn't matter. These things speak and exhort and reprove with all authority. Not because I have authority or you have authority, but God has authority. And we have the authority to tell them what God says. They have authority to reject my opinions. They don't have authority to reject what God says. That needs to take us back to the opening verses of chapter 2. What he said about men, women, their conduct, their differences. The way the world presses us and pushes us to conform us into its mold. Do we really believe the salvation God's provided? Are we really living it out? Accepting the instructions from God's grace that are unfolded in his word? So that my life, my desire is every area it will conform. And sometimes the Spirit convicts me. That's sometimes the problem we have with the Word. It's a cutting Word. It's sharper than any two-edged sword, and it pierces even to the innermost recesses of my life. Don't run away. You know, we think of Jonah trying to run away from God, and we say, how foolish. Some believers think, oh, I won't go back there. I don't go to church anymore. Why? I don't like what I hear. Well, we have to start out. Do you like the message of salvation? Have you come to love it? Believe it? It's then the responsibility follows through. It teaches us something. No one wants to uh, create a dichotomy. Well, I'm saved. I'm just not living like I should. They say that like it's nothing. Um, I, I can accept that. I say, I don't see any evidence you are saved. Because the grace of God that brings salvation changes you and changes your desires. And by your own admission, that hasn't happened to you. You still love the world and things in the world. The Bible says anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. We have to have reality. These are great truths. Easter's message is thrilling. And all of us, including the pastor who's preaching, is to constantly evaluate and look. Is my life really conformed to this? Is this the zeal and passion of my life? If I found it easy to let it go, that it's as God rebuked his people Israel in the Old Testament, you've become weary of me. You say, oh, how tiresome it is. We have to be careful we don't drift there in our spiritual life as God's people. It's never acceptable. I don't want God to say to me, you've become weary of me. I mean, I'd be embarrassed. That'd, that'd be terrible. Oh, you find it tiresome. Those things that you found thrilling, that thrilled your soul that you couldn't get enough of now, that's uh, a little bit tiresome. Then I need to renew, come back. I want to be zealous, passionate. My passion ought to grow, not diminish, as we celebrate and remind ourselves Jesus Christ is alive. And the work of his salvation is going on to bring men to salvation and then to instruct, build up and teach those who have come to salvation so that we can be purified and that we can be zealous that we can be those who are committed to him in all of life let's pray together thank you Lord for the hope that we are reminded of in the resurrection of Jesus Christ because he lives we too shall live some days coming again, we will be gathered to him in glory. These mortal bodies will be transformed into immortality. We
he will share the glory that is his. We will enter into all that you have promised to those who love him. We will be taken to the places that he has prepared for us in the glory of your presence. Lord, in these days of uncertainty, in a world of darkness and uncertainty, we give you praise that we have a sure salvation. We can live every day with confidence and assurance if we live with a fixed hope, even in a world that is passing by. Bless this day, the days you give us ahead. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you. Hope you can join us at 6 this evening.